He has spent more time in space than any other American, and now he's talking to us from the International Space Station. Joining us right now is Expedition 45 Commander Scott Kelly. Commander, a year in space is what you're going to wind up spending. Who did you hack off to get that assignment? There, well, there was a long list, but uh, actually, um, to be honest with you, there were a lot of people in our office that, that wanted to do this. It's, uh, you know, it's an honor to be the uh, first American to spend this amount of time in space, and it's, uh, you know, a challenge, and I look at it as a, uh, as a real privilege. Absolutely. Commander, what do you hope to accomplish in your year in space? Well, you know, on NASA's horizon, uh, hopefully not in the uh, too far distant future, is a journey to Mars. And there are still things we need to know about spending um, the amount of time in space that it will take to get to Mars and, uh, you know, safely get back to Earth. And the space station, you know, while we have it, is a incredible um, opportunity to learn those things with regards to you know mostly in this year with regards to our health and the uh, negative effects that this environment can have in our health and how to mitigate those effects so it's uh, you know it's a great uh, laboratory we have and a great chance to learn those things we need to know to go to Mars sure of course commander your brother is uh, Mark Kelly is an identical twin of yours. Are they going to be, are you essentially a human guinea pig? They're trying to figure out if one guy spends a year in space, how will that impact his body as opposed to the guy, the, his clone, who's here on Earth? Well, in some, uh, at some level, all astronauts and cosmonauts are, are human guinea, guinea pigs in that we participate in a uh, human research program that we are the subjects. And uh, with regards to my brother and I, it was a good opportunity uh, once I was assigned to this flight for NASA to use him as a ground-based control uh, subject uh, for some of the experiments. We had data on him for a very long time, and he's you know, familiar with the, the, uh, you know, the program and how we do things, so it was a great opportunity to learn some extra things on this flight that we wouldn't have uh, necessarily had had we not had somebody that was a, uh, a very almost identical match genetically. Mm -hmm. Commander, first of all, tell us where you are in the International Space Station right now. I mean, it, you got wires everywhere. It looks kind of like just um, part of an airplane or something like that, but you're how far in space, how fast are you going, and where are you right now? Yeah, so I am in the uh, U.S. Destiny Laboratory module. It's kind of the main um, primary module for the U.S. segment of the space station. It's uh, part laboratory, part like, you know, bridge of the Starship Enterprise in a, in a small way. And uh, we are, you know, 250 miles above the surface of the Earth, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. And we are currently over Australia, and it is nighttime. And in uh, about 45 minutes, we'll be, or less than 45 minutes, we'll be flying over the United States. That is so cool. Commander, I, you're kind of floating around. If you are weightless right now, do you mind doing a flip? <laughs> Done. I love that. I want to be able to do that. What sort of training does somebody have to go through to be an astronaut on the International Space Station? There are a lot of kids who still dream of growing up and, and being in your, in your shoes, Commander. Well, you know, we have a, a lot of training once we uh, get selected, and, uh, you know, it's several years, and then there's uh, flight-specific training. That's another, you know, two to three years. But, uh, you know, I look at it as uh, I basically started training for this job when I started going to school and everything I've learned and, uh, you know, all my experiences, especially as I got older in the, in the Navy, um, operational-type experiences are very important to working in this environment. So... 
you know, what I tell kids is it's very important for them to focus on their education and then focus on kind of broadening their, you know, horizons and their abilities with regards to do things that are, you know, kind of an operational nature. You see around here, this is a very busy place with all kinds of equipment, wires, computer equipment, things like that. You know, we can't call the repairman. We have to fix this. We have to understand how these very complicated systems work. So, uh, you know, everything you learn along, along the way is important to doing this job uh, the right way. Sure. Our friend down here on Earth, Pete Hegseth, is an Army vet. I know you're a Navy guy. Uh, he's going to go through a astronaut training in Houston next week. Do you think an Army guy could actually hack what you're doing? No, nah, I don't think so. I think we should have mostly uh, people from the Navy up here. Actually, I'm, I'm, j I'm, j I'm joking. Um, when I got up here, the commander uh, was uh, Terry Virts, Air Force guy. The last time I was up here, the commander of the space station when I first got here was uh, Doug Wheelock, an Army guy. Uh, we have people from all services, um, and, uh, you know, we're all professionals. We... Uh, are all very capable people, and uh, we also have people that aren't from the military. And, uh, you know, I'm currently uh, retired Navy, but we have people that started off in the astronaut program as civilians. And the important thing is to have, you know, people that, uh, you know, work hard, that, um, you know, are relatively smart. I don't think, you know, consider myself the, you know, the smartest person out there, but, uh, you know, have people that are, you know, relatively smart, but more importantly to be able to work as a team because it is a team effort, not only with the folks, you know, up here um, that work up here, but also the folks that we deal with on the ground that make this program happen. Sure. Commander, when you are in space for a year, are you, are you on social media? Are you able to communicate with your loved ones on Earth on Twitter? And what food are you going to miss the most so that as soon as you land, you say, take me to this place? So uh, we have pretty decent uh, capability with regards to email and a, uh, a Skype IP type uh, voice over IP type phone system that allows us to communicate. There's a little bit of a delay. We do have an internet connection that is, uh, you know, it's probably a lot like dial up was. If, uh, you know, I'm sure the kids out there don't know what dial up is, but uh, it allows us to get on the internet. It's, it's slow, not ideal, but better than, than not having, uh, having anything. So there's pretty good capability there uh, to communicate not only with your friends and loved ones, but also with the public uh, in general. And as far as, you know, what type of, uh, of food I'll get when I land, you know, we land in uh, Kazakhstan, so it's not like I can get, you know, something like a corned beef sandwich from uh, New York City or some, you know, New Jersey, New York pizza, but uh, they do the best they can. And, uh, you know, hopefully when I get home, I'll get up to the, uh, the Northeast pretty soon. Well, I tell you what, Commander, when you land, uh, come to me here in New York City, and I'm taking you out for a big steak after a year in space. Commander Scott Kelly, good luck to you, sir, and thank you very much for joining us. My, my pleasure. Great to talk to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the Fox News portion of the event. Please stand by for a voice check from CBS Evening News. Station, this is CBS Evening News. How do you hear me? I hear you loud and clear. Welcome aboard the space station. Thanks for having us and taking some time with us, Captain. We appreciate it. Uh, I want to start out by asking you, I know you're doing a lot of multitasking up there. To what extent do you see your job as an ambassador building the case for space exploration? Well, you know, we have a lot of jobs up here, um, and that's uh, that's one of them. You know, our other jobs are doing the uh, – we're, we're scientists, we're researchers, uh, we're operators of the equipment, uh, we're repairmen, we're, uh, we're, the, we're the, you know, the housekeeper, the person that cleans the place. 
you know, all, we have to fill all these roles. But, uh, you know, being the ambassador for spaceflight is also one of them, and it's important. And we have, you know, a unique perspective up here, um, living and working in this in this laboratory, that it's important for us to share uh, this program as best we can with the with the uh, you know with the taxpayers and the the people around the world that. Uh, that pay for this program is because it is an international program. How much easier is your job of sharing? How much easier has that job been made by social media? Oh, I think it's uh, not only easier for for us to do it, uh, you know, sharing uh, the space program, but I think in general, you know, the public. Uh, affairs role for different organizations have changed you know greatly with uh, with social media each person kind of becomes their own you know for good good or bad a uh, you know a public affairs department so um, you know it's something I enjoy doing and I think it's something I hope that the public enjoys as well all right, so you, you've been uh, setting some records, some longevity records, as far as the American who has spent the most cumulative days in space. And, and now you're on your 221st day, your longest period in space. When you do that kind of longevity, I'd like to know what are the biggest challenges, not just physically, but emotionally, being in space for that duration of time? Well, it is uh, it is a long time. Um, fortunately, I had flown 159 days previously, and that felt like a long time. And I've been up here much longer than that, and I have a long, long time uh, ahead of me. So, uh, you know, uh, you know, I tried to prepare for that. You know, and I recognize uh, that I'm in this enclosed environment. I can't leave. Um, you know, and that's probably the hardest thing is that you you know you don't have the freedom. To just walk out your front door and uh, you know breathe the uh, you know the fresh air and put your feet in the grass and you know those kind of things are you know besides you know human contact is are the things that we miss uh, we miss the most up here um, yeah so I think the the best preparation is just trying to understand the situation we're in and uh, you know coping the best way we can. People think of the romance of space and everyone on earth envies you being up there on the cutting edge of exploration but not every day is probably a great day it's like any other part of being a human being you probably probably have some down days too yeah absolutely um you know when you're doing um uh, you know anything you're going to have you know you anything that people do you're going to have good days and bad days um you know, f for me up here, though, you know, they've been mostly good. Uh, you know, I try to be a pretty positive uh, person and have a pretty good outlook on things. Um, and, you know, understanding that this is a real privilege to be able to, you know, represent my country and, uh, you know, be a part of this. And, you know, as the first, you know, one-year crew member for the United States, at least, is, uh, you know, something that makes it a little bit easier. Now, you said you couldn't just walk out your front door, but last week you did take your first two spacewalks ever. After thinking about that for years, what it would be like, how did the reality compare to what you thought it would be? Well, you know, I thought it would be hard, and it, and it was hard work. Um, a lot of people probably wouldn't believe this, but it wasn't really, it wasn't really fun. It was kind of that that type two kind of fun and it's fun when when it's over you know while you're doing it you're like oh, this is really hard and uh, but when you're done you're like wow that was a lot of fun it's kind of like that kind of fun and uh, the view was a lot better than I thought it would be which really surprised me um, we got another one here coming up on Friday and I'm really looking forward to it and I hope it I hope it goes as well as the first one we're working uh, pretty uh, hard towards that uh, that goal So it might be a fair way to describe it. You don't like space walking. You like having space walked. I could, yeah, I, I guess I could say that. You know, it's uh, it's 
pretty challenging. It's also a pretty risky environment out there, so it's not like it's not that like we kind of fun you know you have when you're on a roller coaster or something like that. But it is, you know, it is fun in uh, in hindsight because it is you know it's so much of a challenge. I want to ask you. You mentioned the views. I want to ask you about sunrises and sunsets because you get a lot more than two a day. I think by our count, thirty five hundred so far. Uh, this trip, are they all the same, or do some sunsets look better and different than others? Well, they all they all vary. Um, not only do they vary in how they look um, because of the you know the environment and the atmosphere, uh, but they also vary in how long they last based on our, our orbit and uh, you know how we are our orbit is in relation to the sun. So some last longer than others. They're all spectacular. Um, you know, sunrises on Earth, though, are pretty incredible, too. And, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of hard to compare the two. But the good thing about the ones on Earth is they, I think they vary much more in how they look and their appearance. And they last much longer because, you know, they're, you're not going around the Earth at 17,500 miles an hour. But like you said, uh, we get a lot more of them up here. When you had been looking at sunrises and sunsets from inside the space station, is there any difference from when you're observing a sunrise or sunset while you're space walking? It's incredible, the difference. Like I said, I didn't, um, you know, I had heard people say, tell me that, that the view is just amazing. And I thought, you know, the view is pretty amazing up here uh, looking out the window. How could it be much more amazing? But when you're looking through one, um, you know, pane of glass that the helmet uh, visor is and uh, how your, you know, your face is kind of up in the visor so your field of view is much greater. It is just a completely different level of, uh, you know, color and brilliance that you see of the earth than, uh, than we see here looking out the windows. Although, you know, this is a great view, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really compare to being outside. Captain, I got time for one more question. Uh, you know, the mission of the last 15 years um, has been to obviously further humanity's understanding of space. Nine years left on this mission. What do you hope to find and make an argument for why it should be more than nine years and this kind of exploration needs to continue? Well, you know, being a, you know, former member of the military, I don't uh, like the idea of, uh, you know, giving up ground that we've we've taken. And this is a, uh, you know, a foothold in space, uh, the International Space Station, where we continue to learn things. Um, uh, you know, so far we've learned uh, an incredible amount on how to build the life support systems, uh, electrical system. Uh, you know, the procedures, the operations, the working with the ground. Uh, we've learned a lot about uh, human health and uh, how this environment, you know, negatively affects our, our bodies, but also how to mitigate some of those effects. And there's a lot more to learn. Now, whether, uh, you know, nine years from now, if or whenever we decide to, uh, you know, uh, retire the space station, because at some point we, we, probably will. I mean, I guess you could keep adding on modules and maybe taking away ones that no longer uh, serve their purposes. But, uh, you know, if we don't continue this space station, I hope we're continuing another or, you know, something on the moon and eventually, you know, possibly Mars or, or will be Mars, uh, hopefully not too far in a distant future. Captain, thank you so much for your time. I will say hi to West Orange for you tonight on my ride home to Montclair. Thank you. Enjoyed talking to you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. And thank you, Fox News and CBS Evening News. Station, we're now resuming operational audio communications.